Well, welcome uh, to Inside the Outhouse for yet another session. I believe our fourth session in 2021. And it's a very exciting evening this evening. We've got the uh, Outdoor Council of Australia and they've come into the outhouse to talk to us about their national summit 2021. And so welcome friends and fellow orators. Just before we get started, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognizes, recognize the continuing connection to lands, waters, and communities. We pay our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders both past and present and emerging. Just a reminder to patrons inside this evening that we are recording this session so that we can sh share this vital collaboration with the wider community. And uh, thanks to the management team of Sheree, David, Maddie, and Henry for all their tireless work in promoting and supporting and maintaining this essential community event. My name is Pete Smith, founder, orator, and telemarker, and I'm excited to welcome you to this very special Inside the Outhouse as the Outdoor Council of Australia reveals the how, what, and why of the OCA National Summit 2021. I will now pass the big mic to Andrew Knight, Vice President of the OCA and Executive Officer of Outdoors Victoria for a short presentation on the details of the OCA National Summit. Um, then we will open a regular outhouse discussion. Um, I will have uh, David Maskell monitor in the chat and uh, let's sit back and enjoy what Andrew has to say. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pete. And uh, lovely to say hello to everyone tonight. Um, we've got a whole bunch of states represented tonight. So that's fantastic. Um, Jamie over in WA, correct me if I'm wrong. Scott, g'day in SA. Um, and uh, we've got New South Wales with Laurie and she's touring out back New South Wales. So we might get some good views later on. Um, and, uh, and then we've got um, um, a whole bunch of great people in Queensland and um, in, including uh, um, Dom up there, who's the president of OCA. So um, welcome everyone tonight. Um, and um, just really want to um, um, bring up something that's going to, to help us out a bit to visualize what we're going to quickly chat about, and then we'll get to a decent Q and A session. Um, so I'll have a go at sharing my screen and um, see if we can get that done. So I might just ask uh, maybe Pete, if you can let me know, if you can see the um, lovely uh, vision for the positive cycle. I can indeed, it's very positive from my uh, viewpoint. Fantastic. So this is, um, a graphic representation of what we'd love to get a um, hundred great people together across Australia to, to discuss this. Um, and the, the outcome of that discussion would be that hopefully we've got a, um, a good couple of working groups that we can get out of these um, bubbles um, and then get on with um, working on those. So if we start right the crock at the, 12 o'clock mark, you've got reaching all year nine to 12 students to inform them of available outdoor careers. And I'll even add to that, that it's not just going to be students in their late high school years that we need to reach to. It'll also be to the wider community as we go forward, because there's some wonderful people who are joining us uh, in the mature age area um, to, uh, to have a career in the outdoors as a, as a second or third career. The next part of this positive cycle is to then um, discuss and work on um, clarifying the various training pathways. Um, we all know on the call that there's a number of different ways that um, you can be qualified in the outdoors um, to, to work in different careers in the outdoors, um, whether that be um, with Paddle Australia, the Australian Climbing Instructors Association, um, across in the, the snow as well, and their association um, with private RTOs, as well as 
the government run RTOs at TAFE and the universities around Australia. So um, the next part of this positive cycle um, for us in the future is um, to explore um, what are the potential accreditation systems we could use for individual accreditation. Um, we'll, um, when we're going to be all meeting in mid-June, um, these 100 um, participants, um, it'll really be also acknowledging that there's been a whole lot of work done in the past around um, a number of these, these areas. And um, one of them being back in 2012, there was a national get together um, and there's some great notes and outcomes from that particular meeting. So we'll be working on collating all of that past information that's, that's already come for us to then be able to benefit as we go forward with um, creating this positive cycle for us into the future. The other thing that we'll be doing too is looking at overseas and seeing what um, the outdoors sector is doing in other parts of the world and bringing that to the table in the middle of the year. And then, um, um, yeah, basically using that great information from the past and experts from overseas to help us form up what could be um, a positive cycle for us in, in Australia over the next couple of decades. The next part of the um, um, positive cycle there is around what have we got currently in the um, organisation and the club as well as the business accreditation area um, and um, discuss and, and work on that um, going forward. We've then also got um, as part of the positive cycle superior product offer across the sectors to international and domestic tourists to schools, to community groups, and also to adventure therapists. And that leading to boosting client numbers, business profitability, which then means that the businesses can reinvest further in staff in galvanized marketing efforts across the sector, as well as in um, improvements to infrastructure, whether that be soft or hard infrastructure. With the increased clientele and the boost of profitability, um, that also leads to um, improved paying conditions that can be offered by a whole lot of um, employers. Um, and um, that'll help to lead to better retention of professionals across our sectors and also um, improve the systems that we've got um, to, uh, to make sure that we continue that positive cycle. All this leading back to um, the community, and I've obviously highlighted year nines to twelves, um, being really keen to join our sectors in the outdoors and look forward to a long and rewarding career that's uh, got a whole lot of clarity around it. So what, what I might do is, Dom, if you'd like to just fill in any particular gaps, because I don't um, admit to being the, the absolute oracle on all of this, but um, this is definitely um, some, some really important steps, um, we believe, to, to what we need to do to come together to discuss this with a whole lot of great people from around Australia to, to work on the future of, of the outdoor sectors. So, Dom, if you'd like to point out any other pieces, that'd be great. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, and um, I think it's a, I guess it's a good summary of this proposal of what we're looking at as far as creating or improving this positive cycle. Aspects of this are already going on right now across the outdoors. It's just the real, what we really want to do with this summit is get a group of people together, really have a discussion about these various different aspects of the entire ecosystem, I guess, that is the outdoor sectors or the outdoor sectors, I think we're starting to say, um, and recognising that it's not just one homogenous group of organisations. So um, I guess really we're looking at what are the different aspects of, of this 
And are there other things that we've missed through this? Are there, are there some other parts of it that we need to consider? Um, what, we've, what we've decided as far as this actual summit, um, what we'd like to do, we're trying to limit it to around 100 people, um, but just to make it manageable for us as a fairly small organisation of volunteers. We're trying to limit the actual summit. We'll um, be predominantly running it through Zoom uh, and again, we don't want to have open it up and have a thousand people on there and not be able to have everyone contribute. Um, I guess in an ideal world, we'd love that if we could manage it, but we've got to, um, I guess, be quite realistic about it. So that's how we're looking to do it. The way we want to manage that is to have the, the board members of the OCA actually invite people, but we're setting up like a, uh, a matrix to make sure we get a spread of people from different areas right across the outdoor sector, right across the country. So we're being quite deliberate about that. We, 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 I guess the thing's gonna be, you know, if you're number 110 and you don't get an invite, don't feel we don't think you're important, but it might be that we've already got, you know, an, other people with similar experience or that sort of thing. So that, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get it so that we get the spread across the country, um, but also what we want to make sure is anyone else who's not in the actual, you know, the invited groups of people who are able to come to the summit can also provide input into this process, can be either emailing or speaking to the ACO board members. Um, and also what we're looking to do, which Andrew touched on is as part of the summit, form some work, working groups to work on some of those um, those sections that set out in those circles on the screen to then work on that over the next however long it takes. So there'll also be opportunities for further feedback into that process. We're not, with the Outdoor Council of Australia as the peak industry organisation, um, but we're not trying to pretend we've got all the answers. We're trying to, trying to get to some more answers that, through this process. So that's probably the big, big part of it. We're not we're not just going to, you know, have a summit for the sake of having it and, and then trot out at the end of a day's work. Here's all the solutions we prepared earlier. It really is going to be the start of a genuine collaborative process. And if we don't, you know, we may not answer all of these things because some of them are things that have been kicking around for a long time, but at least we can get started on it. We can bring people together to work on it from right across the whole sectors. Sectors. I was going to start saying that properly. Thanks, Dom. That really did fill in the gaps. Um, so, Pete, I don't know whether you'd like to start with any questions or, or David or someone else in the outhouse, and, and we'll, we'll then welcome the, the next part of the process with Q&A. Well, we'll uh, let's just open it up to the floor. Um, I obviously have questions, but does anyone have any questions uh, for the presenter? And let's just have a discussion about uh, what was presented for sure and what i'll do is i'll just stop sharing so if anyone needs to just grab a quick shot of that on their phone so they can refer to it i'll leave it up for another 10 seconds and i'll take it down so we can see everyone again okay I've just spotted yeah, Pete, two. My money's on, Andrew, my money's on Dave Chitty to ask the first question. <laughs> well, I've, I'm wondering too if Laurie, also on the OCA board, would like to add anything else to Laurie? Oh, not really, guys. Uh, you said it beautifully. And um, yeah, I've got to run anyway because the signal keeps going in and out. So I don't know if you've been hearing this. Um, lovely, Timabara. But uh, look, yes, absolutely. You said it really well. I think this is a, a, an opportunity for the whole sector, education, recreation, anyone that's across all the four spectrums of outdoor industry to come together and start working on some of the challenges. And 
um, no doubt setting a bit of a path for the future. Um, from my perspective, being a little bit new to the sector, I, I can start seeing, um, I've used the analogy of oil on top of a water surface. It's, um, COVID has certainly enabled us to see some of the things a lot of, bit clearer. Um, so our job now is to scoop it off and make sure it doesn't come back. And I think uh, we can collectively do that. The conversations I've already had have been amazing with um, the current OCA board and, and major stakeholders in the industry. And yeah, I'm really excited about this. Thanks, Laurie, very much. And one thing I'd like to add too is that there'll be two really important considerations when we're looking at that positive cycle that we need to consider around the whole of the, the cycle is um, climate change and what we have to do to hopefully be leaders in climate change adaptation around our handprint and around our footprint. Um, and also to ensure that we consider Aboriginal Australia um, communities in how they will work with us um, over the next number of decades too. So those two pieces will be really, really important for us to all um, address in the working groups as we, uh, as we develop and then come back to um, a gathering in another six months time to, to see how we've gone progressing in those work groups. I'm gonna throw a question to the room because um, there's been a lot of chatter in uh, various uh, forums that I've at least been observing over the last couple of weeks about the fact that we're really a, a sector or sectors that don't do very well promoting ourselves and people who have been uh, working in this area for perhaps a longer period of time are quite vocal about the fact that we don't really do a great job at our own promotion. Um, do people agree with this? Do they think it's untrue? What are the people's feelings about this? And how can we change it? Yeah, a whole lot of people nodding. I think no, that's I quite great, Pete. I think, I think it, yeah, the outdoor sector or sectors, it, that's partly why I think we get taken for granted a lot. Um, it's it's not in your face all the time. The, you know, even the, the clear benefits of what we do and for so many communities and the different aspects of it, whether it's the health benefits, the educational benefits, the um, environmental benefits, but also the economic benefits of what we do, they're significant and they're not well appreciated. And I think that's something that we need to get better at blowing our own horn a little bit more. Um, you know, we're all very quiet and uh, people who hide our, bush, hide our lights under a bushel like you, Pete. But um, it's, it's what I think we need to actually get better at and actually make sure the decision makers genuinely do understand those different aspects of what we're doing. And I think that's the advantage of having people like Laurie that have um, had a marketing and tourism background. And that's the type of thing that we need to look at when we're looking at the people that we'll invite along is to make sure that we're, we're ticking off on those different parts of the cycle to make sure we've got some, some subject experts to help us with that. Andrew, can I jump in for a second? Welcome, Matt, how are you? Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm I'm Matt Cox. Um, I'm actually I, I work with Aaron down at Victoria University, um, coordinating all of our outdoor programs. For uh, those, those of you who don't don't know me, um, I guess I've I've got a little bit of a, a perspective on some of this sort of stuff, and I'll try and not um, make it too too academic, but. Um, my, my PhD is all about how outdoor leaders develop professional identity. And so I actually did a longitudinal study on my students across three years about how they're developing their professional identity. And what I, I found really interesting um, is that they all indicated that they constantly battled deeply entrenched social perceptions from, from outside of the the people that are in the know and i think that's that's a broader issue that we have in the industry in terms of 
getting people to understand, like what Dom was saying, you know, about the benefits that we have is battling these perceptions that don't actually view what we do as being worthwhile. Um, like one of the, I guess, the, the constructs that I'm using in my research is about social binaries. And, you know, there's, there's binaries that, that operate like work versus play and mind versus body. And where we tend to fit within our sector and a lot of the work that we do is in the, the play and body side of that binary and the play in the body side of the binary tends to be devalued versus the the mind and the work side of the binary and so what we do is we sit in this side that society doesn't value and then what we're trying to constantly do is shift people's deeply entrenched perceptions about what is valuable within society um, and I guess that's some of the, the, the feedback or some of the data that was coming out of dealing with my students is that they're, they're constantly reporting that they're coming across this, oh, all you do is have fun or, you know, that's not real work. And so if we're trying to um, lift the profile of the perception of the profession or the sector, um, we've actually got to work out how we can confront those really deeply entrenched social perceptions. Because unless we can shift those perceptions, then we're not going to gain the, the acceptance. Like, you know, the example I always use is an accountant. No one really devalues an accountant. They go, oh, you're an accountant. I know what you do. Okay. I, I can understand what it is that you do. Um, but they don't sit there and go, oh, but all you do is just play with numbers and, you know, spreadsheets and stuff like that. They actually go, oh, no, you have value because you provide a service. So we need to actually get to a, a place where um, people go, oh, we understand what you do. We see the value in it. We know the service that you provide. Um, I guess that's some of what I'm, I'm finding um, just in terms of those, those social perceptions that we're having to battle constantly. Matt, Matt, Matthew, um, uh, do you have research that you've published on this particular topic? And I might also reference the, the other academics I know are in the meeting, like Scott. Um, yep. Has this been something that's been developed and published and is ongoing research or is it future research? It's, it's future. I'm, I'm kind of in the, in the write-up phase of my PhD at the moment. So, yes, this will, this will be all coming out sort of at some stage next year. It's really interesting, Matt. Like, I think it's it's obviously very valuable as far as that sort of things. And I guess part of it's going to be what's the practical recommendations. Like, do we start presenting? You know, the the way of trying to flip that a little bit is presenting our workforce, including our volunteers, as risk management specialists and as actual people who can take people out and give them valuable experiences that are aimed at a health outcome, whether it's physical health or mental health or uh, the social connections that you get with it, connection to a particular place. Is it about trying to actually show the deliberate aims that are behind our programs more than, you know, that, like you said, the, the play side of things? Is that is that the sort of stuff that we need to consider more in marketing of this stuff, do you think? Something that sort of sits on the, the periphery of, of the, the findings that I've got um, is around like the words that we use, the nomenclature, um, you know, and I've even found this at the university over the last you know, 10 years that I've been, well, longer than that that I've been working there, but I've actively been trying to do this is, you know, years ago, we used to say we took the students on camps. And then, you know, it was there, oh, then we're going on field trips. And now, you know, and, and then it was, oh, no, we're actually going field labs. And now we're going and we're teaching in the field. So it's constantly trying, from my perspective, it's shifting that, that nomenclature to something that people find value in. Um, and, you know, within, within the realm of academia, if you say you're taking students on a camp or students on a trip, that's not valid. But if you're actually taking them out and teaching them in the field, or providing them with some kind of lab, then that's seen as being valid. 
So, you know, I'm just trying to think of how that transfers across to the broader sector and how we then communicate what it is that we do to the broader community in terms of the words that we use. Because obviously, you know, if we're coming at it from a, an adventure recreation perspective, well, you know, you want to be talking up the, the fun and the excitement and yes, we're going camping, but, you know, if you're coming at it from the other end of the spectrum, maybe an educational perspective, you know, or some kind of therapeutic perspective, well, there's different, different words that you want to use. So it's trying to identify what words actually work for the message that you're trying to communicate. That's, that's so insightful, Matt. And it's sort of leads into what I've been asking for the DET and the careers councillors of Australia um, association for the last sort of year or so is we'd really love to be able to have some serious chats with the careers council association around um, how are you presenting careers and outdoors? Yeah. And um, see what they're actually um, putting forward. Um, and, you know, I've heard some really sad stories about particular careers counsellors um, not, not putting us forward at all, but actually you've had parents coming up saying, oh, you know, my, my son or daughter went on this particular um, field trip with the outdoor education teacher and actually quite keen to explore a career in the outdoors. And, and the careers council actually shut it down yep. and, and because they're not well informed about our, our sector and, and definitely, um, you know, that's an opportunity for us. And so what the Department of Education of Victoria has done, and this is the type of thing that we can bring to this summit with the, the good people from across Oz, is to say, hey, look, the Department of Education of Victoria is actually going to provide that opportunity to showcase anything up to 158 times in the curriculum across a particular subject, career examples. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's going to be some really exciting work that we've put our hand up for in Victoria to be a part of and to work with the Careers Councillors Association of Australia with the Department of Education in Vic to, to work on, on that around our particular careers. And then there'll be someone else from, from Maths Teachers Association doing the same thing, pushing careers in maths, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the kind of wonderful learnings that I'm getting now tonight from you, Matt, but also um, that we'll be able to take and discuss further and unpack further so that we can make some progress nationally around this, because that's just one way that we can get to a whole lot more people. If, if we got to every, even if it was every year seven to every year 12 around Australia over a couple of years in their curriculum, um, that'd be just really wonderful and, and would be a very, very informed way of doing it because we'd be helping with the narrative after things like the summit. So can I can I uh, play devil's advocate, which is sometimes my role here? How do we address that in other states that don't have outdoor ed explicitly in their curriculum? It might be in the um, uh, general competencies area of the national curriculum, but in Queensland there is no outdoor education. So I work in the field still, and I regularly ask teachers what are your outcomes for camp? Because they still call it camp. And I'll say, oh, no outcomes. We're here to have fun. Yeah, and I think that's, um, I'll, I'll invite other people. I'll quickly answer a little bit of that because I've had a bit of a think about that, um, is, is that we do some work um, down here with some other um, professional teachers associations, like the Geography Teachers Association of Vic, the Environment Education Teachers Association, as well as Ashba Victoria. Um, and so there's, there's, there's the, just there, there's three different opportunities across different subjects and, and parts of the curriculum that we could um, link into. So I think you're right though, Dave, that's exactly a, a, a perfect question. And, and, and I'm writing that down now, is how, how, do, we, how do we go across the different um, jurisdictions and be able to reach into all those um, departments of education over time because I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity um, to, to get us some um, some really clear airtime with a whole like a whole less uh, and reduced amount of noise around what we're trying to um, 
get to get to the population. Is is it the Department of Education uh, that we need to be addressing it to, or the people who are delivering counselling and career choices? Is that a separate body from schools, or is it sometimes the same, or so is it jurisdictional? It, 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 that's right. The good thing is with the Careers Councils Association of Australia, they have different branches. Um, but once we get to them, which which I'm just starting to do, and there's going to be some meetings over the next couple of months, which will involve a number of people, um, some of which are on the call now, um, I think that's that's definitely where we, we have as one opportunity and then another opportunity is with the different departments of education. And there's a myriad of different other ways if you want to for one of another word at the moment but it is marketing our sector so that this is one of probably a suite of different things that we should be doing um yes yeah, so i hope that helps david and one, one of the things i think we probably need to do is actually develop a plan yeah of of who we need to influence and broadly how we need to influence them some things might be a longer term for instance uh, years ago um you know, the previous uh, Outdoors Victoria, we took uh, a very big interest in the uh, the first uh, bush kindergarten out at, at West Garth in Australia, yeah, first bush kindy in Australia. And that's a whole sector now, right? So there's a whole stack of parents and kids that are coming through the system that will believe in the outdoors and the value of the outdoors. So you can have that longer term thing. Um, if we developed a pathway where people could come into our industry learn amazing skills, stay around five to 10 years and then go and get jobs in mining and yeah, um, yeah, any other industry out there, we might need to train our people a little bit more. We would then become a repository for, uh, yeah, for uh, the best leaders and the best risk managers in Australia over time. Um, and, and people would start to believe that our industry had a valuable place in society. And of course, you've got to convince the broader public and you've got to convince governments as well. So, but I think we've got to develop a plan, basically. Uh, it's no use doing it. Yeah, we do things piecemeal at the moment. Yeah, a plan, yeah, with the Outdoor Council that can be jiggled a little bit by states and other organisations. But uh, so we're all basically heading in the same direction. Um, David, as part of, part of that plan, Something that um, I guess I've, I've always wondered about, and I've had this discussion a few times over the years, and I've really struggled to, to get a, a good answer. And I'll, I'll, I'll use the analogy of, of sports role models. You know, in, in society, you know, sports role models get held up as these people, and then you have kids go, oh, I want to be a footballer, I want to be a cricketer, or I want to, you know, play netball, or I want to do this sort of stuff. And partially because that's where marketing dollars go to as well. And there's that whole cycle that sits around that. But what have we got in the outdoor sector where we can hold someone up as a role model? Because if we can, if we can start to get people going, oh, look at that person, you know, look at what they do for a job. Wouldn't that be a great opportunity, you know? Or you have parents going, hey, that'd be great. You know, kids, look at this person. Um, you know, I remember years ago, there was, oh, what was his name? Jesse, someone who sailed around the world, um, young guy. And there's been a couple of young young women that have done that. But just trying to work out, you know, who is there within our industry that, that can be held up from that perspective to attract attention? And then potentially, you know, the marketing side follows that. And then if you've got the dollars following it, then you start to address some of these other issues that, that Andrew's been speaking to speaking about. I mean, in the 1800s, outdoor adventurers were the, yeah, yeah. the sports heroes, the Everests, the Cavers. Yeah. The, the, yeah. So, I mean, we've been there before. Yeah. And again, I think that's a, a part of a plan. You know? There's plenty of amazing role models out there. It might be... It might be older people, and I'm not talking about me, by the way, older people who are still doing amazing things, yeah, that can yep. be a role models for healthy lifestyle with the um, with senior citizens, yeah. It might be, you know, amazing women, you know. Uh, um, there's a Get a Grip of the Grind Festival in Victoria that's about women and, uh, um, you know, breaking away from you know, traditional roles, not just getting locked up in the workplace, and they use a role modelling thing there. Um, and we've got all sorts of other disabled people doing amazing things. We just don't market them. 
Yeah. I think one of the things you need to consider is how realistic it is to relate to those types of role models. I mean, it's great to, you know, uh, role model Andrew Locke or um, I'm not sure who the 16-year-old girl that went to across Greenland, the North Pole and the South Pole were. But, you know, the affordability to be able to do those kind of things as a young, young, a young person is very, very removed. So how do we make this a bit more kind of local to relate to what some of the people in our states are doing to kind of inspire these kids? One of the examples might be um, Alex Moog and Kyle Addy um, with their climb up in Queensland when they did the um, um, Grand Corduroy Trousers. But we might even things like we, Bo we Miles. Might for, we might look for successful right. politicians, successful business people successful medical people and that that owe part of their success to being in the outdoors along the way i'm sure we could find people that um yeah so that parents would be saying hey yeah like uh, there are if i allow my child to get involved in the outdoors either recreational industry it will improve their chances of success in the future so it might not be just the heroes it might be just those ordinary people that have just improved their lot through um, involvement in the outdoors. A lot of transferable professional skills that people learn through um, involvement in these, in these jobs, whether that's professionally or voluntarily. Yeah. Oh. I might just quickly jump in here, everyone. I also do a bit of work in the arts industry. And I think one of the things that the arts does really well is articulate as um, everyone has said here, I guess the role models that work really well that are no longer in the industry. Um, and, and even ones that are still, but they, they were able to do that really effectively because I think they kind of track people as they go through. And I think if there's some way we can better track, you know, maybe it's even at a local level, you know, where our people are going it can relate back to what David was saying before about kind of showing people that, you know, even if you don't want to stay in the outdoors for a long period of time, the outdoors is such an important and transformational thing to do. Yeah, thanks, Henry. I've noted that as well. Thank you. I mean, in uh, just to take what Henry was saying there, we're really talking about a lot of professions and that have ambassadors yeah so you have someone like peter martin who yeah yeah famous outdoor educator we all know about him perhaps but uh yeah um he's still doing the outdoors and people like that could be ambassadors you know go around talk to schools uh, talk to government um yeah people that might not be working in the outdoors anymore but um still yeah can 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 relate to some people at higher levels yeah Are those people relatable to the young people? Well, we can find those as well. I mean, yeah, I've, I've just been employing three young highliners, you know, the, and, uh, and, and, and climbers. Uh, I had to bring one in from Tassie because you know, we were a bit short, you know, everyone's short of staff, yeah, and, and all the schools loved them, you know. I mean, they might be a bit smelly and have long hair, but they've got degrees, they're smart, they're cool. The teachers like them and the kids reckon they were amazing, yeah. I mean, they live in bands, so I'm not quite sure they're a totally good role model, but uh, yeah. Aaron, probably just posing a bit of an alternative view. I think some of the reason why students don't want to get into the outdoors is also their parents or other support networks are telling them not to, which I think kind of comes back to what we were saying before and also Matthew's point about the industry has a, a visibility problem as it's seen as something you kind of do just for fun. But I think there is some considerable value in actually getting the people to lobby not really to the like the students that we want to try and get into the industry but also parents government um and even professional bodies of other industries to kind of go look you know if, if my parents are telling me i shouldn't go into outdoor ed or into outdoor rec or something how do we get in there before they've had the conversation with me to say actually there is a lot of benefit for my child to be doing something in the outdoors and i think to my mind, that's the really key point where potentially, you know, you need probably two different types of role models to hit both targets simultaneously. 
Yeah, I, I can agree with what you're saying there, Henry. Um, you know, in, in my experience over the last few years at, at the U, and I'll use like our open day as an example, um, we had had a course, you know, our courses were set up and, um, you know, every year you'd have kids coming in with their parents to open day and, and often it'd be the parents going, so what jobs do they get out of this? How much money do they make? You know, is this something they can do for a long time? Um, and then over the process of a few years, um, you know, I created a couple of new degrees at, at Victoria University. And um, the way that I structured those degrees was actually um, built demo like demonstrable career, long-term career paths into the, the scaffold and learning process so that I could actually stand there and say to the parents, look, yes, they can work here and, you know, they've got all these outdoor skills, but then... They're also qualified scientists. And so, you know, after they finish lugging packs around the bush or whatever it is they're doing, then they can actually transfer into a more science-focused role. Or, you know, in one of our degrees, you know, we do have a, a partnership um, with, with OEG and I can stand there and I can say, look, you know, these students can walk straight into a, into a job paying X amount of dollars with OEG. And as soon as you started talking like that, the parents started jumping on board. They were like, oh, okay. So I can actually see that there is a career path here, that it doesn't just involve them you know, being in the bush for the rest of their life. And I think that's maybe where some of the blocks are, is that's often the image that we've got, is that we're, you know, like, like David was just saying, you know, live in vans, crunchy, long-haired people that, you know, carry packs around. But actually, we do have a really diverse set of skills and knowledge that can take us in lots of different directions down the track. And so being able to communicate that to parents is really important to get their support to guide their kids into you know, the right direction. Hey, Matt, we run a 30 second video where the first 15 seconds is uh, a kid doing something awesome, or a group of kids doing something awesome, and the voiceover saying, do you want your child to be a safety management specialist? And the second 15 seconds is, do you want to do fun stuff? And yeah. just show that it's exactly the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's sell it to the parents in one way and the kids in a different way. And seriously, like you think about it, if you talk about safety management systems for 16, 17, 18 year olds up to about 28, if you're male, um, that, that is actually something that a lot of parents really value. Um, and really that's something that we probably don't even think that we're offering as much as we should, you know, and the other one is um, the, you know, the stats, I don't know what it is these days, but I think a few years ago they were saying that the average person will have seven careers these days. I think it's probably up to about a dozen now. So yep. if you think about a, a serious grounding in safety management, wow, that's a pretty good life skill. If, if we went out to a range of industries, you know, um, defence, mining, construction, whatever you like, and said of the people you're young people you're currently employing, yeah, um, eighteen to thirty, what skills do they lack that you would value that we can provide? Yeah, we could go out to the rest of the world, and then we could make sure. I think you're on the ball anyway, but I think we could then we could then add those skills into what we provide to our pathways people that will get poached and given really good jobs in their 30s, yeah? Um, we go and ask, what do they need? Yeah. Um, I might take the conversation in a different direction. Um, it's been talked about on social media and Facebook explicitly quite a bit, and we had a whole Zoom meeting about it um, two meetings ago where we had twice as many people talking about wages and conditions. Uh, we start talking about uh, big picture reform and the plan that the OCA has, and we have half as many people engaged with that discussion. Is that a concern for the industry, do you think? Well, you I guys sorted it all out a couple of weeks ago, didn't you, Doug? <laughs> yeah, sure. Everybody's going to get paid eight hundred dollars a day. Um, it's yeah, it's it's a given. It's just we're just waiting for it to happen now. I, yeah, no, I sorry, think, mate. I'll, sorry, I'll let you go. Sorry. Yeah. No. I think people are working really long hours at the moment, both organisations and stuff. 
playing catch up and uh, yeah, often multiple schools. Uh, I know my instructors are exhausted by the end of a week. I'm not even bothering with tourism much of a weekend because we're just yeah, struggling to even do the hours uh, with the number of work we've got. So I think there's people that would like to be part of this, but not here. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, uh, not everyone wants to think strategically. Yeah, most people are probably thinking at the simplest stuff, pay, you know, uh, do I have to have a first aid kit? Whereas when we get into the more complex subjects, it's, uh, um, it's probably just those that have a, a, a long view that are going to come along in these types of meetings. Doesn't mean we're not going to get there, though. I think another thing is um, we're in peak weeks at the moment across across the country. A lot of our um, a lot of our outdoor leaders are out in the field at the moment, so it's hard for them to engage in inside the outhouse on a Monday Monday evening when they've just met their groups and probably currently facilitating transit briefings. I think the fact that we're having these conversations at the moment, though, tends to, to me to say that we, we're probably um, becoming more of an industry as a general um, as a general thing, and that you know discussions about pay, discussions about um, workplace health and safety, discussions about a whole range of things, are really sort of um, I suppose more into that that ilk of where we're talking from a, um, an industry or a sector type of base now. So I think the, some of these questions and some of these things are going to be um, hard, hard things over the next little bit, but I think that's um, all par for the course, really. I, I will return to the fact that I... Well, I, I spent last weekend leading a bushwalk with a guy who has worked in marketing for 25 years of his life. He's, he's worked in food marketing. And so he wants to change careers. And so he wants to get into, into leading bushwalks and taking people into the bush. And it was a fascinating weekend of bushwalking, but also... I learned a lot about marketing and I, and I would go back to the fact that um, we're, everyone in the room is really passionate about this issue. And I, and I think, you know, the fact that we're all here and talking about it is really good. But I think in the actual marketing of um, <clears throat> the sector and the, um, the, shall we say, the limitations within the sector, I think that we we perhaps do that in injustice, and it leaves us it leaves us not uh, perhaps not talking to the right people, or perhaps having the wrong conversations with those people. I think what you just said, then David Strickland from Sport and Rec Victoria, a number of uh, years ago, said uh, about a national outdoor ed conference in Adelaide. He said this is amazing, but who isn't here? And I looked around, I think, I think everyone's here. He said, oh yeah, all the people that believe in outdoor education are here. He said, but we haven't invited the principals that don't believe, yeah? We haven't had all those other people. He, th he, he suggested that we should, our conferences and stuff should be not about us, professional development, we still need a bit of that, but we should be running them around, inviting all those other people along and convincing them of the value. Uh, yeah, so yeah, changes like that probably need to happen in the way we, we run our PDs. Yeah. Pete, you, I also think you hit on a really good point there, um, and this is something for you guys to consider, is that maybe we don't have the full skill set to be able to market outdoor education um, in a national approach, and potentially we need to get a third party in that's going to lead the campaign. I agree, and on all professional things, let's let's in work out what we need to achieve, and then find professionals in those fields to help us. Yeah, it's interesting because this is something that OEG did was went through a, a rebrand um, when they went through a restructure a few years ago, and they got a um, a third party in to do a marketing survey and to create a new logo and a new kind of branding imaging for the company 
and they created the, the red triangle um, out of, out of, as a result of that. So, you know, it definitely is something that looks very aesthetical and has had some results. I think a big part of this is if it's, and I don't, I don't, I'd agree with you as far as marketing the sector to the general public, it's, it's not done well. It's partly goes back to some of what uh, was discussed earlier about it just being the fun stuff that you do in your spare time. But there's also a piece of getting to those decision makers so that they understand the, all of those different values. But it also is going to come back to who's paying for it all, who's actually funding those sort of campaigns, you know, it's at the minute, the ACA doesn't get one set of any government support, which is another problem that we have as a sector. We don't have a funded national body. It's basically working because of the contributions of the different state peak bodies and a couple of national organisations who contribute as board members. Um, but it's not, a, you know, it's not a funded lobby group that can get in, in those doors and be banging on the on the door of the different ministers or whoever. And that's, a, that's another part of our issue that we don't have that as an organisation um, that's leading the way. And it's, I would say it's very much the same right across, you know, if you go down to not just at the ACA level, at other levels, often it's, we, our industry tends to run on the smell of an oily rag. We, we tend to just get on with it and we do a pretty good job with what we've got resources wise, but none of our organisations is over resourced. You go right to the different state activity peak bodies, they're all scrabbling, you know, they're all trying to do the best they can and all the time and often rely on almost completely on volunteers. And I think there's nothing wrong with that, except it's, it actually does affect the, the outcomes that you can produce if you're on limited resources all the time. And it also burns people out, which we have to be conscious of. It burns people out in the field, but it also burns people out in roles like mine and Andrew's um, all the time. And that's something that happens. And then you lose that experience and you, you lose those contacts that people build up. So it's another weird thing that it's not just our industry, but it's particularly seems to be prevalent in, our, in the outdoor sector that that does happen. Well, perhaps an outcome of this forum in June, in May, June or whenever should be to come up with some solutions to, uh, yeah, to make the uh, Outdoor Council of Australia a viable organisation. Yeah? You've got 100 people from around Australia, um, key people, perhaps they can come up with a solution. It should at least be posed as a problem. I just posted a, a link into the chat about a, a movie from a few years ago called Project Wild Thing. I don't know if anyone remembers seeing that. It's maybe like six or seven years ago. Um, but it was a, a movie from the UK where the premise was this guy was trying to work out, you know, how to market nature. Um, and, you know, trying to address the issue in the UK of kids not spending enough time outside. And, um, you know, he got some of the, the best marketers in the, U, in the UK to come in and try and work out how to market nature um, and to basically sort of try and address what it is that we're somewhat talking about at the moment. And, um, you know, I, if I remember correctly, because I haven't seen the movie for a while, it was that uh, it's really, really difficult to do um, to actually market nature and connect it to, to what it is that we're doing. One from the financial side of things, but um, one of the positive things that did come out of that movie though, was this process that they went through about getting all of these people engaged. And I'm just thinking about this, this summit and sort of what Dave was saying just then and going through this, you know, sort of innovation process. And I'm also thinking about, you know, like a design thinking process which can be done reasonably quickly, but they got in, you know, design people, they got in tech people, they got in people from outside of the industry and threw this problem at them and said, how do we actually do it? And they came up with some really innovative, interesting ways to actually solve the problem. Um, so maybe, you know, there's, there's something there. Like I, um, 
you know, me and a group of, of people from from VU ran a design thinking workshop with OEG in the middle of COVID last year about innovating new programs within the space. Um, so, you know, there, there are some experts on design thinking process, which is a, an innovation process that's come out of Stanford Business School over in the US, um, which is which can be, you know, done quite quickly and, and easily or can, you know, take place over a, a period of days or something like that. But maybe there's, there's something there about getting people like, you know, everyone's saying from outside of the ones that are in the know to actually come in and add a fresh perspective on how do we address this issue? Um, and that, that movie, by the way, is free now. You can watch it online for free. Um, so Project Wild Thing, if you're, you're interested in it. It's fantastic. Cool. We, had him, we had him come out, David Bond. We came out and did some speaking when yep. we, in relation to Nature Play when we were running uh, some speaking stuff. One yeah, of his great. best ones was a, in a courtyard, concrete courtyard outside a pretty dodgy uh, residential tower in the middle of London. The council had put up signs all over the place saying no ball games. Yes. So he wrote the word no on a soccer ball and said, okay, this is a no ball. So now you can play games with it. Here you go, kids. And yeah. just let him, let him go. And yeah. that's what he went, no, oh, that's no ball. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's really cool. It goes from that. And he was trying to make the point of that sort of play it is still outdoor play for kids going right through to, you know, roaming in the bush or in the forest over there. So yeah, it, he speaks really well about it, but yeah, it's, um, it's a good point you make about the thinking outside the box um, as far as trying to get this stuff working. We could also yeah. look at, uh, at how other peak bodies in other worlds uh, and professions yeah, manage. Yeah, the Pharmacists Guild or the yeah, Professional Association May, they sell lollies, those lollies that, that you buy in the pharmacy, yeah, uh, and the profits go to run their organisation. Our Chamber of Commerce in Bright, I don't live in Bright, but I'm the bloody vice president, yeah, but anyway, uh, I'm not even in the shire. Uh, we employ a, a part-time uh, you know, admin manager and she runs the town's markets, right? And the profits that are left over from the markets pay her, her bills so that we can have a someone to make sure the Chamber of Commerce actually functions, yeah? And there would be, that's a little example and a big example. There must be lots of other ways of where organisations do something to, to make sure they're financially viable as organisations, but it's not actually related to their trade or business, yeah? Yeah, thanks, Just David. a dollar from every time there's an ad on telly showing up their activities. Um. If I don't mind just jumping in there, I just, uh, Matt, I fully agree with you. I, I think Project uh, Wild Thing is a, is a really amazing movie. And I guess my takeaway message from that type of initiative is that we really, I think in the, the sector or the sectors need to do something that's pretty radical and quite different to what we have been doing for the last, however long we want to go back in history. And that's what I think we should be excited about going forward with the OCA National Summit is doing something that actually is, you know, makes our sector look really different because we're actually doing something really different. And maybe, as Henry said, we need to take some uh, leaves out of the art sector or other sectors that seem to do community engagement really well. Um, Thanks for a very interactive discussion. Um, just coming up to the uh, two minutes before the hour of 13. Um, Matt, thanks for that great video. That will become video of the week um, because uh, you posted it in the chat. So excellent job there. And um, we'll look forward to uh, hearing more about the OCA National Summit moving forward. I'll just throw over to Andrew Knight, uh, to have a few closing words and then we'll stop the recording. Thanks very much again. Yeah, Pete, it's been great to um, be able to have a chat to everyone and let everyone know that this is coming. Um, we'll be able to provide um, dates very soon um, and um, how the process is going to work because as Dom pointed to, is that we'll have um, the ICA board members as, as chairs of these particular work groups. And, and everyone will have their email addresses to make sure that everyone in the, in the outdoors community can communicate 
write new ideas or questions and concerns to the chairs of these particular work groups. So that we've got the whole community being able to be part of what we're going to do over the next number of months and years. Um, and we'd love to continue to give you some updates via inside, inside the outhouse. So thank you very much for, for, uh, for letting us showcase it today.